Well, Gaza is in the midst of an epic humanitarian catastrophe, says the Secretary General of the United Nations. This as calls grow for a ceasefire to replace the temporary truce between Israel and Hamas. The truce has allowed some more aid to reach Gaza, but Antonio Guterres says it's not nearly enough. The level of aid to Palestinians in Gaza remains completely inadequate to meet the huge needs of more than 2 million people. And although the total volume of fuel allowed into Gaza has also increased, it remains utterly insufficient to sustain basic operations. Julia Tuma is the director of communications for the UN agency that oversees the Palestinian territories. Juliet, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, David. Uh, so since we last spoke, you were able to visit Gaza briefly. Uh, what can you tell us about what you saw when you were inside? Yes, thanks. Um, look, I was there for a couple of days just before the pause kicked in, uh, David, and uh, it was, uh, first of all, very, very good to meet again with uh, colleagues and with the team on the ground, the UNRWA team, who are doing such a heroic job. At the same time, there was constant bombardment uh, during the day, during the night. I was awoken myself to the sound of bombardment. Um, the place looked like it's been hit by an earthquake, and this is um, only parts um, that we were um, able to get to, which is the south, but every other building was impacted. Um, the shelters that I um, visited were overcrowded. People were literally on top of each other. Five weeks into the war, people said to us that they were cold, that the weather was getting um, worse, that it had just rained. They didn't have blankets. Some were still wearing sandals. Some couldn't change their clothes on them. It's a terrible situation altogether. Well, the, the situation now, at least with this pause in, in the fighting, is allowing to get you some badly needed aid uh, into Gaza. How, how, how has that changed things? What have you been able to get in and, and what needs have you been able to meet? Yeah, we certainly have seen an increase in uh, the aid supplies and the humanitarian assistance that's been coming into Gaza in comparison to pre-pause uh, situations. But we're not at all close to what Gaza used to get before the war. Uh, this is 500 trucks every day, including, by the way, commercial trucks. Mm -hmm. So what we're calling for is not just the continuation of the delivery of humanitarian assistance, but also to give a boost to the private sector. You see, David, every single shop that we drove past was closed. The pharmacies were closed. The banks were closed, apart from a few bakeries that managed to remain open with very long queues outside of them and a few vegetable stalls here and there. There isn't anything. The market has completely collapsed. So humanitarians cannot do it alone, not in the in medium term to the long term, definitely. So there needs to be commercial supplies to come in to revive the markets uh, that have collapsed in Gaza. So, so when you went to Gaza, you were able to tour parts of southern Gaza and see that for yourself. And that's been the part of Gaza as difficult as, as it's been to get aid in that's been able to receive some aid. The north is another story. And I understand because of this pause, it's the first time you've been able to deliver aid to the Jabalia area. What, what, what did people tell you about the situation there and, and in northern Gaza? Indeed, our teams uh, managed to get in supplies uh, of uh, assistance, uh, including blankets, medicine, drinking water to the north. Jabalia was, until the war, the largest Palestine refugee camp in the Gaza Strip. Uh, we managed to get in with this assistance and also to check in on our colleagues who managed to stay on the ground in Jabalia to keep the medical facility in the camp open, to keep the shelters maintained, including pumping uh, water stations as one example. And the fact that they stayed and delivered is just a testament to the heroism that and the courage that they, they have shown over the past 50 plus days. We're, you know, in this pause, uh, it's been extended once already. There is talk of it potentially being extended uh, again. But Israel, from Prime Minister Netanyahu on down, has made it very clear this will not be a permanent ceasefire or an end to their military operations. We've talked about, you know, 10,000 people in a shelter designed for 2,000 people, and, and Israel now pushing even further south. What happens um, 
when, when this ceasefire ends, if Israel I I is per going to live up to its word and continue its military campaign to eradicate Hamas? So this has been a pause and it's been temporary and all eyes are on a bit later tonight when we will all know whether this pause is going to be extended and we do hope that it is extended and that it would transform into a longer term humanitarian ceasefire. It is very much needed for the sake of civilians wherever they are. And the longer this war goes on, the farther away we are from a solution, a political peaceful solution to this decades long crisis. If you look at what Israel was doing sort of before the pause, uh, targeting sort of Han Yunus and other parts of, of southern Gaza as sort of the next push, um, I, I assume you have shelters in those areas if they're trying to get people to flee and move out. I mean, is there capacity to absorb a further dislocation of people inside southern Gaza? Two thirds of our shelters are south of Wadi Gaza. Uh, so, so the vast majority, except they are overflowing with people and people continue to flock into our shelters. The shelter that I visited in Khan Yunus had 30,000 people previous to that, to previous to the war, it was a staff college. Um, and today it's it's just a shelter overflowing with people. People are forced to, to sleep on the concrete, David. Um, they Many of them are sleeping in shacks. Um, so we also do not have the ability um, or the availability to take in more people. This is yet another reason why it is totally a must to have a humanitarian ceasefire. Just as a, a final point, Juliet, um, as we've been speaking throughout this conflict, the, the number of your colleagues who have been killed has just kept growing. I think the, mm -hmm. the latest number I've seen is 109. Um, the World Health Organization is warning about respiratory viruses and other disease ripping through the population in there because everyone's crammed together in these overcrowded shelters. Uh, what is the status of your people inside Gaza now in terms of how they're doing and what they're saying about their ability to, to, to keep doing their work if, if hostilities resume? Look, the only downside of this uh, pause has been um, that we were able to research and verify um, information about reports of killed colleagues and um, as a result the, the number of UNRWA colleagues killed in the war has climbed up to 111 now um, and this is what we were able to confirm and we are extremely worried and afraid that the number is likely um, higher than that. However the determination and the courage of our colleagues, of the UNRWA colleagues on the ground is, is absolutely admirable. Um, even in the North, we continue to run shelters, we continue to help people who are in those areas. Uh, our teams are out there working around the clock to deliver the little assistance that we continue to have. Um, some are working with the communities, including on providing counseling and psychological support. I think the size of trauma and shock is humongous. Mm. Julia Tuma, the Director of Communications for UNRWA, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, David.